Hello, all you happy innovators out there. Are you having a good week? I hope you're having a good week. Um, interestingly enough, I'm coming up on the one-year anniversary of Snowflake 33. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit right now and explain something to you that I'm pretty sure I haven't talked about uh, in any of the episodes that I've put out over the past year. Now, when I first started doing Snowflake 33 a year ago, I kind of set a couple of guidelines about how I was going to do it because, believe me, I mean, I'm sure you can tell uh, by just the... Uh, the randomness of the you know the episodes over the past year that I really didn't have a specific direction for Snowflake 33. I, I started out with you know no solid ideas, just a microphone and you know coffee and time. And uh, Snowflake 33 was something that I had been wanting to do for a very long time. I just didn't really know how to do it. I didn't know what I was doing, and, you know, after years of kind of trying to, uh, you know, map it out and form a plan, one day I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to start doing it, and I did, and that was a year ago, okay? Um, what I kind of decided when I first started was, among many things, when I, when I first started doing Snowflake 33, was that... Uh, the reason that I called it Snowflake 33 was because I figured I would make 33 episodes kind of like a prototype, kind of like a test. Uh, and I would do 33 episodes or I would do one solid year. And then I would just kind of take stock of what I had, you know, uh, hopefully I would have learned a couple of things, um, had a better sense of direction as to how I want to proceed in the future and possibly change the name of the project so that it would no longer be called Snowflake 33. It was kind of like a test run for the past year. And uh, so now, like I said, I'm, I'm coming up on the year anniversary and it just so happens that I'm maybe just a couple more episodes away from hitting 33. And... Uh, I will say that after that, I'm going to be changing quite a bit of what I'm doing, okay? Not exactly sure about all the details just yet, but I've had about a year to evaluate and take stock of this project, and, and uh, I definitely have, you know, one year later, a better sense of where I want to go and what I want to do. So, um, having said that, now, um, I, I basically decided that what I was going to do with Snowflake 33, you know, probably about a couple months in to the year uh, of doing it, I kind of decided that what I thought would be best would be to kind of give you an introduction to me. Because, let's face it. Uh, you might know my songs or something, but you don't really know anything about me. And I don't do a whole lot of interviews, okay? And uh, so I decided that what I was going to do was um, give you, the listener, kind of an introduction to me, like as someone who doesn't know me. And uh, hence the whole, you know, fame discussion and all of those things. I mean, yes, I have given you some descriptions of albums and I've, you know, had different ideas that I've uh, tried out. But for the most part, I considered the first year, the first 33 episodes, um, like a, a formal introduction so that going forward in, into the future with different topics or whatever, you'd have some idea of where I was coming from as a musician and as the owner of Pipe Choir Records, that um, it would inform the future. And so, like I said, that year is almost up and uh, there will be some changes 
that I'm going to be making. Quite a few, actually. I have a lot of ideas. Uh, definitely have a clearer direction uh, of what I want Snowflake 33 to become and what I want it to be. Um, I don't have, you know, 100% of it mapped out or anything like that. There's still some open endedness to this whole project, but um, I'm pretty sure that the name will be changing. Uh, the format may even be changing. Um, if you've gone along with me this far, uh, I figured that was worth explaining to you. And so, okay, having gotten that out of the way, what I want to do is continue on with the story of when I left Slow Bob as their drummer and I continued on with the Mort band. And, you know, when I think about that whole time and that whole situation, what really comes to mind at first are these things. Um, one, I have to kind of tell you that it's important for you to know that ever since the inception of Pipe Choir back in like 1991, 92, 93, back in the day when I was still drumming in Thumper Incorporated, from that point on, I was always working on Pipe Choir material. Even though I was busy drumming in other bands and doing other things, in my spare time, in my free time, I was always uh, refining my songwriting and learning how to play instruments and just kind of, you know, uh, refining what pipe choir was. Okay, I never stopped making pipe choir music. Even when I was drumming in Slow Bob and the Mort Band at the same time, I still found some time to work on pipe choir stuff. It never stopped. And another thing that I wanted to mention was that um, throughout all that time, um, especially from my family members and the people that I was closest to, um, whenever I would talk to my family and my friends about what I was doing musically, like drumming for Slow Bob or, you know, making CDs with them and all those things or even with the Mort Band, uh, you know, touring and doing all those things, whatever we were doing, okay? Um, every time I presented what I was working on musically to my family and to my close friends, they would always answer it with, like, what about pipe choir? Are you still doing that? What's up with that? You should be doing pipe choir. That's good. I like pipe choir. You should be doing that. I and mean, it was like every time I'd say, here's the new Slow Bob CD. You know, we just recorded it here. And here it is. And they'd listen to it and they'd go, oh, that's that's nice. What about pipe choir? Are you still doing that? I and mean, it was like every single time. Okay. And I'd say, yes, I'm still doing that too. But this is, you know, the band I'm drumming in right now. And uh, like I said, just over and over again, same thing. You should be doing pipe choir. And I wanted to mention that because I think it matters. Okay. And another thing that I want to talk about, especially with the Mort band, was um, previously I had mentioned that Slow Bob recorded everything that we did, even at rehearsals, like onto cassette tape. And we had a you know, a rack of cassette tapes that were just filled with new song ideas and rehearsal recordings. And just, I mean, we had this library of reference material and uh, we recorded everything. And what I can say about the Mort band in that regard is this, that Mort, as a songwriter, uh, one of the things I noticed about him was his huge back catalog of cassette tape recordings that he had done on his four track that, um, you know, he had let me hear a lot of his ideas on these four track tapes. And it became really kind of clear to me more through him than with Slow Bob, um, the importance of 
cataloging new ideas. Okay, so I, uh, I noticed that about him right away, and I was kind of stunned when I saw how much material he had worked on just by himself, just sketches and ideas, and just how valuable that can be. Um, and I realized I did not have that for Pipe Choir. Um, I suppose having said that, I should explain that um, the Mort band was to Mort what Pipe Choir was to me. I was the drummer in the Mort band. It was his band. Okay, It was his brainchild. It, they were his ideas, and I was just drumming to them. Okay, and I had no problem with that because it was abundantly clear to me that he was way more talented than I was as a songwriter. And uh, I may not be the smartest guy in the world, okay, but I'm smart enough to know when somebody's better than I am. And there was a lot that I could learn from him as a songwriter. And believe me, I did. I mean, I was taking notes, you know, because uh, he was really good. <laughs> he was really talented and really good. And uh, so, like I was saying, I kind of noticed that he had, like Slow Bob, this huge you know, library of ideas uh, that were recorded that he could go back to and reference later in the future. And I knew that for Pipe Choir, I did not have that. I realized that if I was going to make Pipe Choir grow into a more developed idea, I was going to need to learn how to record myself. Okay. Um, that idea was really driven home by Mort and watching him and learning from him. So, fast forward a little bit into the future, maybe a year or so, into my tenure as the drummer in the Mort Band, and that's where my wife enters the story, the woman who would become my wife, okay? And uh, I can say this, that right off the bat, one of the first things that she did for me was she bought me a four track you know it's like at any moment you know I could have bought myself one but it just I just was so bewildered by the process of recording that it didn't even really cross my mind like I didn't think that I would be able to do it okay and I was wrong of course I was able to do it and I found out that I was wrong about that because my wife bought me a four track as a gift, a very nice gift. And uh, I started to immediately learn, you know, I learned on the fly. I had no idea how to use a four track. And uh, it was like a little Tascam cassette recorder like I've explained to you before. You know, it wasn't anything fancy. But uh, it was just as bewildering to me as, you know, anything else would be. Um, and I had to learn it, and I did. And, and that was really a turning point for me as a musician. And it was unfortunately kind of the beginning of the end of my career as a live drummer because what would subsequently wind up happening over the next maybe two years or three years uh, that I was in the Mort band, um, I would find myself becoming more and more disillusioned and disinterested in collaborating with the band. And I found myself wanting to spend more time at home and working on my own material. Um, my own ideas started to become more interesting than playing live drums in a band. And 
the process of recording at home was much more fun. I mean, I was always the kind of musician that liked working in the studio more than anything else. Um, unfortunately, you know, back in the day, it was so expensive. And I was always at the mercy of, you know, engineers and their pay scale and trying to translate the concepts and the music, really, that I was hearing in my mind to some guy, you know. I had to communicate my ideas and my vision to someone, and that was, for the most part, a lot more difficult. And most of the time, it really didn't come out quite like I had in mind. Like, um, the process of recording is a funny thing, especially when it's an idea that you hear in your head and you're trying to talk to someone else about it. Um, because most of the time I might have a, a lot of the idea, but I don't have all of it. Uh, 75% of it is in my head, is in my mind, and then the other 25% comes after I've recorded it and I get to listen to it. Then I might change it a little bit. But when I was in the studio with other engineers, I was under the gun and I was on the clock and I had to hurry and there wasn't a whole lot of time for just listening, listening, you know, to what I had done. Um, you'd be surprised at how much listening I do to an idea while I'm working on it. You know, I would say I spend almost as much time listening to something I've recorded as I did recording it. Like, it's a very important part of the process. When you're spending $100 an hour in a studio, there isn't a whole lot of time for just listening and letting ideas develop. It really wasn't conducive to my music and what I was doing. And it, and it was through this four track that my beautiful wife had bought for me as a gift, my introduction to home recording, that I really started to love it. I mean, I, I had always liked the pipe choir material. I had always enjoyed it, okay? And the process of writing songs was fun. Even though they didn't always sound so good, it was still fun. But after I got that four track, I really started to fall in love with it and it became consuming. I didn't want to do anything else. And let me tell you, um, while my interest in playing live drums for a band started to dwindle, right at that same time, my love for home recording started to rise. And it became very clear to me that this was the direction that I was going to go in for the rest of my life. Uh, but there were a lot of other things happening too. Uh, and, you know, I thought about it since I started talking about the whole Mort band thing. And um, I could go into all these uh, details about that situation and, and how that went, okay? But, like I said before, they are still a working band. Um, and I don't want to harm what they're doing. Uh, I respect Mort's privacy and his ambitions as a musician. And I admire him for still being uh, a recording artist. He never stopped. Uh, and I admire that. So I'm not going to go into all the stories about the Mort Band. Um, in the next episode, I'll tell you a couple of them. But for the most part, things ended badly. And, uh, you know, I had started to make a Snowflake episode, actually, uh, talking about it. And I realized after I had finished that episode that it was so negative. <laughs> that, you know, it's really not a happy story. It's really not. And uh, kind of sad, actually, and a little disappointing, I'm sure, for everyone 
involved. So um, I scrapped that episode. I mean, just was like, this is, you know, it's like a, a waste of time. And who wants to hear that? So I'm going to stop here for right now. And I'll pick it up in the next episode. And yes, like I said, I'll tell you a couple stories. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it. That'll be in the next episode. So for now, this is Mike Bostwick from Pipe Choir Records signing off. And remember, folks, if you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy. <laughs>